Danny Boom. Danny Boom. Danny 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 in, in 2008, I had a really good year with, with Ducati, won the British Championship. I always found that if I if I won, I had a great team, but if I lost, I was a shit rider. And it's like, well, hold on a minute. You could make a comeback. Hopefully you don't. <laughs> Not what I'm racing anyway. <laughs> now sit there and shut up and, and get off your keyboard because you'll realise after how hard it yeah. is, you know. When you said you can never underestimate any any of your rivals. I've had Noriyuki Haga as a teammate, right? And I looked up to him. He was like a hero of mine back in the day. I went to yeah. watch him in World yeah. Superbike. Did I achieve everything I wanted to achieve? No, I didn't. No. Danny got back. What a ride this is. Hello, guys. Welcome to Season 1, Episode 4 on Pushing the Limit Podcast with me, Danny Bucken. We have uh, today a very successful racer, Shaky Burn. How are you, mate? Very well, thank you. Yourself? I went high pitch then. You like did. I was fangirling. Yeah, no. <laughs> oh, quite impressed. Shaky Burn. <laughs> How are you, mate? Good? Yeah, yeah no, good. Not yeah. bad at all. Welcome to, uh, yeah, welcome to Pushing the Limit, obviously. We're just going to have a little chat and, uh, yeah get into it mate we're going to start i want to find out what um yeah like where did you grow up and uh did that kind of like did where you grew up shape you as a person like shape you as the person you are today or? i think it's a difficult one to answer i mean i grew up um i was born in london born in lambeth and i was adopted really early like six weeks old literally um i was adopted and taken to sitting born in kent yeah. and grew up there um when you say, you know, did it did it shape you as a person, it's, it's a difficult one because I think that, yeah, for me, growing up, all I've ever wanted to be was was essentially the person that I ended up being, which was a motorbike racer. Like, I don't remember don't remember anything, no. anything other than, you know, I didn't really pay that much attention at school because I was running around the classroom making motorbike noises. Do you know Where did I mean? that come from? Like, I don't the motorbike know. Honestly, don't know. Yeah. Do you know my... my sort of non-biological parents don't even have a driving license. So so where yeah, it came yeah, from, I, I have no idea. But I think it's one of the things, you know, when you say about did it shape you, yeah. I think that, you know, a lot of people nowadays, you know, they'll they'll start racing or whatever, they'll they'll do some motocross or mini moto at a young age. But it's not necessarily because that's what the the kid wants to do. It's because that's what the the, the dad and the family love doing. Yeah, you know yourself, right? Yeah. You come from schoolboy motocross yeah. and your dad probably got you up at whatever time in the morning and, and sent you off to a motocross track and, yeah. and away you went and you done your racing and at the end of it, it all, you loved it. Yeah. But for me, um, everything about about me and my racing came because of of a, of a dream, of a, of a desire to be a motorbike racer. And, and, you know, there wasn't there wasn't a, I don't know, family support, if you like, to, to make it happen at all. So I had to make it happen. And I guess, yeah, that's, that's why, why it's so deeply instilled. Yeah. It's mad that you actually, yeah, like, where did it come from? Like, how did, you must have, you must have seen something, mustn't you? Like, yeah. Because I was like really into cars when I was younger. So I always thought, yeah. But when I, when I started riding the motorbikes, I was like, this is it. The motorbikes is my thing. And, and yeah, but it's quite mad that you've like, like, that was one of my questions. Like, where did it come from? Like, the love of motorbike racing? Because obviously you, you did start your professional career started quite late, isn't it? Compared to like, yeah. like you say, most kids start at six, they go motocross, they go pit biking. Oh, we make the next step and, and all that. But obviously you didn't have that luxury, did you? Your, your story is actually really impressive on how you've started racing motorbikes. I don't know if it's impressive, to be fair, but. Well, I think it's impressive. <laughs> I think it's you know cool. The, the funny thing about it is, right, we went, we, I remember... My my earliest recollection of motorbikes, yeah. full stop, was at Bognor Regis at the the Butlins Holiday Camp, yeah, right? Love because it. we used to go there every year, mum and dad. I'm off in February. And oh yeah, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> man, loves it. Um, they used to have a little motorbike thing there, right? Yeah. Little pooch, I don't know what they were called, Raiders or yeah. whatever. Um, and and you could literally go there and and hire a bike and ride around this little sort of tarmac oval, and. I'd spend so much of my holiday when when we went there, like literally just sat on the <laughs> bank, just watching the bikes going round and yeah. round and round. But I was too young to ride at the time. And one particular year we went, and I must have been like four or five years old or something. And I think the limit was seven or something. And my cousin, who was a couple of years older than me, probably a bit more than that, three or four years older than me, got quite friendly with the guys who who ran the the bikes, right? So he's like, oh, can my little cousin have a go? Can he have a go? Like, <laughs> you've seen him. He's just yeah. sat there the whole time watching. Yeah. Can he have a go around? And I remember him putting me on this bike and like walking me around this like tarmac <laughs> yeah. over. And I was like, this is it. Do you yeah. know what I mean? This yeah. is me. But where where any of the racing thing came from before that, I just literally, it's not like I can say, oh yeah, do you know what happened? I watched this, uh, yeah. I watched this race or I watched this or I watched that. 
and and that's what got me into it. Or that's what made me think I want to do it. Like I, I know I know nothing else. Do you know what I mean? That's yeah. why that's why I'm lost now because yeah. literally apart from from doing the TV thing with with racing and and looking after a couple of riders, like there's this massive massive hole in my yeah, life at the moment where racing used to be because it was all I ever wanted to be you know yeah so when when you was in like high school or secondary school and that was you flying about on bikes and like like field bikes and things like that or was you did you kind of go from being like a young lad obviously getting your bike license doing a bit for fast bikes was it yep did a bit yeah. of fast bikes uh, basically what happened was I used to ride a little bit when I was about 11 or 12 mm. on trials bikes and stuff like that and then um you know <laughs> like you do you know you spend a bit of time messing about on on bikes yeah. that um you know perhaps you shouldn't and then I I used to work as a as a Saturday boy at a, a motorbike shop when I was young, right, like thirteen or fourteen years old. And I remember we had this guy that um, who used to be a racer, and he'd had this he had had this really bad crash and banged his head and and you know was was not the full shit, yeah, if you know yeah. what I mean. But lovely guy. Mm. Anyway, long story short, on Saturdays, um, you know the the mechanic and the boss would go for their lunch and you know this guy eric would come along sit in the shop with me and uh you know i'd stay there with him and answer the phone and make some notes and you know if somebody called up and said oh you know we want to buy this or we need to order that or whatever i'd write it all down yeah. and then when they came back i'd just give them the thing and, and and they could get on with it well eric and i devised this cunning plan right because you know i'm 14 <laughs> years old now and, I, and i'd already told him that i was going to be the next world champion yeah. or whatever and um i said listen eric um, basically anybody that calls, right, <laughs> yeah. take the note, write down whatever <laughs> you've got to write down. Um, but if, if Mick or Dave call, like the, the, the two bosses, um, I've just gone for a number two, right? Yeah. So he's like, right, 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 no problem. <laughs> anyway, we used to take great pleasure because he was like, he, you know what I mean? He yeah. was right up for it. Yeah. So basically what we used to do at like 14 years old, we used to go and take a bike out of the lineup, whichever size yeah. it was, and literally just go <laughs> roar around the streets yeah. and then bring it back, put it back in yeah. the lineup before the guys come no back for way. dinner. So yeah, no, not been the best behaved of, of children. Have you ever caught up with the guys since? Did they, did they know you was over up to it? Like if you said it now, would they be like, do you know what? The bike was always hot or it was always ticking. <laughs> yeah. Do you know like the bike's got like yeah, yeah, that's after it. you've yeah. been abused for like, uh, I, I think I think we've pretty much got away with it. it yeah. yeah, there were there were a couple of uh, a couple of instances actually where <laughs> actually when I was sixteen and started working at the shop properly, where we had a, a few altercations with uh, with a local constabulary because <laughs> of because of, uh, of things I'd been up yeah. to on bikes around town. But yeah. um, no, it's all cool. That's mega though, isn't it? And then obviously, so then you got the job for fast bikes and then wheeling bikes around. That came about in a really weird way though, yeah. because basically what happened was. Um, like I said to you, everything, everything that happened for me happened because I sort of made it happen. So yeah. I, I started working, you know, after the bike shop, you know, it was clear that me and work weren't, weren't really getting on that well. So, yeah. um, I ended up working with my dad on the London underground yeah. and at the time that was, that was quite good money, you know, for like a 19 year old kid mm. or whatever I was, I can't remember what I was earning now, but it was, it seemed all good right. Money, at the time. Yeah. yeah. Permanent nights. So you had all day to mess about and whatever else, but you know, I'd been I'd been waiting on promises for for a really long time because I'd done a tiny bit of motocross, literally a few months worth of motocross mm. when I was a bit younger, and then um, <clears throat> basically I I bought myself a bike on the road. I had an RGV two fifty and I had it on the road for like five days, blew the thing to smithereens, and then decided, you know what, enough's enough. I'm gonna have to go race. Did your parents mind as well? Like you had a bike on the road, or were they not really that? Uh, my mum and dad were. The, the, let's just say they weren't supportive. Yeah, you yeah. know they weren't they weren't against no, the idea. But, but you know, like I it. think I think they knew they knew that nothing was gonna gonna stop me. Do you no. know what I mean? I think I'm I think I'm quite driven. Do you yeah. know what I mean? When yeah. I when I set my mind to something, You're I, I want to make it yeah. happen. Yeah. So anyway, um, this RGV 250 we were going to. I was I was due to be banned from driving anyway. Yeah. So this RGV 250 <laughs> was going to be put on the on, on the racetrack, and I was going to start my racing career with it. But um, it turned out it was going to cost a fortune to do. So I put it back as a road bike, part exchanged it for a race bike, and then away I went. And then literally rocked up. Did you start winning? Did, was you just, did you? <coughs> well, actually, I, I was so lucky, it? right? Yeah, like because I time. did two track days yeah. and... Brands. I did Brands. Yeah. And then I did Lydon, yeah. Lydon Hill. Lydon, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then my first ever race meeting was at Brands Hatch, the the third time I'd basically ridden on a track yeah. and I won. And I was like, oh my God. Yeah, I, that was I, easy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah done, nailed it, mate. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, it, kind of away we went, really. At 96, that was. And, you know, the rest of the season didn't go quite so well. I busted my wrist quite badly. And, um, yeah, just had a, a few crashes. But I did enough to, to get noticed. And in 97, 
I started riding, I was sponsored already, you know, basically I'd only had to pay for 96. So I yeah. bought the bike, paid for everything for that, for that one season. And then 97, I got a free ride at club racing and, and did pretty good, you yeah. know, just literally won near enough everything we entered. Um, but whilst doing that, I got offered a, a one-off ride on one of them CB500 things. And it was at the time when James Toesland was, was literally the, the new up and coming thing. Cause he was riding in a CB500 yeah, yeah, cup yeah. and he was smashing everything. Um, so I got an opportunity to ride in, in that championship, but my teammate, um, unbeknown to me was, um, Jimmy Miller, who was one of the fast bikes testers. Oh, okay. So now, you know, I'd, I'd been reading fast bikes magazine for years, right. And, and reading the race riots in yeah, there yeah. and watching the guys and what have you. So when I first met him, it was like, oh I was like, gosh. I was blown yeah. away. So oh my yeah. God, it's Jimmy, it's Jimmy. Yeah. But we got on really well. Um, and long story short, he was like, oh, you know, you should come up to London one day and, and come and meet Colin and blah, blah, blah. And I was like holy shit, I don't even know yeah. how to, I don't even know how to yeah. go on the tubes it's or nothing. Nice, do you yeah. know what I mean? Like this is, yeah. this is bonkers. But yeah, I went up and met them and they were like, oh yeah, come out and come and do a test with yeah. us or whatever. And went out, uh, funnily enough, went south of France, went to a track called Le Luc and I got to ride all sorts of 750s and whatever, which were the things at the time. And I sent one upside down at like turn three or whatever. And I thought, oh no, this is my fast bike's yeah. career over. But the, the boss couldn't have been happier. And Loving he was it. like, oh mate, it was peaking. So yeah, from there it was just, couple of years of absolute chaos with fast bikes yeah and you said obviously like being like driven is something that's in like your personality do you think that is from where you weren't gifted the opportunities as such a young lad you know like where you as a young lad you're like you you're in your bedroom you're like i just want to race bikes want to race bikes do you think that kind of like that mindset is something that has helped you through your career do you know like like not taking no for an answer, like being driven, going out and getting it yourself, not expecting a foot up, you know, like obviously you get a lot of people now talking about this kind of thing. And it's, and it's quite, for me, it's like quite an important thing in racing and business is just to have that. You're not going to stop me. If I can't go that way, I'll go that way. And would you say that was something you've had as a young lad and just sort of kept all the way through? I think, I think ultimately you just want to keep the dream going, don't you? Do you mm. know what I mean? You want to, you want to get it going and, and keep it going and you want it to, to roll on as long as possible. And, you know, can sit here now and, and you know, I have a, a pretty good record in BSB. But do you know what the weird thing is, is that, you know, whilst whilst I've won a lot more races than anyone else in BSB and I've won a, a lot more championships than anyone else in BSB, it was never enough mm. because ultimately my dream was to be a world champion. Yeah. Now, I got to race in, in two world championships, MotoGP and, and World Superbike, but I didn't win the championship. So sat here right now, like I said to you earlier on, I feel like there's this uh, this massive hole in my life because racing's not in it at the moment, yeah. as in me riding. Yeah. But at the same time, if I have to accept that that racing is over now and racing's done, mm. well, I kind of failed my mission a little bit. Yes, I made it happen. Yes, I got it started, and yes, I continued it, and yes, I did all right in terms of BSB. But I wanted to be a world champion. Yeah. I still do now. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? I just yeah. want to be able to say I'm a champion of the yeah. world. Do you know what I mean? I've done what I wanted yeah. to do, but and I, not taken away though. Like being a BSB, like. I, th I don't think until you get in that championship, I don't think people understand how hard it is to win a race in BSB, let alone win consistent championships. Like it's incredible. Isn't it? And like the fact that you've done it, it's like, and the, the step to world superbike then was it, was you on a, un, was you in, in on inferior um, bike as such? Or did you like, do you feel like if you got, cause I always say like, if you put you on a decent bike in that year, you probably would have won. Cause Everyone has so much talent, but having that sort of extra bit around helps give that little push, doesn't it? And yeah. do you think if you got on the factory bike that year, you could have won? I do. Yeah, easy. Like, <laughs> I don't know. I don't <laughs> no. know if it would have been easy, <laughs> no. but no. I, um, the, the strange thing was in, in 2008, I had a really good year with, with Ducati, won the British Championship, and Troy Bayliss was retiring at, a, at that, the end of that year. And there was a, there was a lot of talk about me stepping up from from BSB going straight to um World Superbike on the factory yeah. bike and and that would have been the dream do you know what I mean because ultimately you know all the manufacturers you know they, they say that the, the bikes are the same or they're just different color fairings or whatever and and yeah. yeah these are factory bikes and these are factory bikes or whatever but there's always something isn't there and I think when you you know when you have the the kind of best team around you um and the most successful team around you you know that team's successful for a reason and Colin Wright once described to me um, how he saw a team and he saw a team as a pyramid. So he said, if you think about a pyramid and the way a pyramid's built, the easiest thing to change is the, is the very top piece. Yeah. So if the, if the bottom row and the second row and the third row and the fourth row are all really, really solid, built around solid people, 
then the easiest thing to change is the rider, which sits on the top. Yeah. Um, but the team, the structure has to be there. And if you put a good rider on the top, then the, t the rider benefits from, from the, the, the structure that's underneath yeah. him. And yeah, I think you're right. I think if you, if I'd have had that opportunity, then, then I'd love to think that we could have gone out and certainly had a better go at the championship than we yeah. did in, in 2009. But, you know, you also think you have all these little conspiracy theories. I was, I turned up, you know, I'd never, never been to Porto Mayo before my first ever test and the race weekend happened. Max Biaggi and Rubens House were Sterile Garda's riders. And I think it took me 12 laps to go faster than Ruben had been all weekend. And it took something like 30 laps to go faster than Max. And then I ended up going faster than Bayliss had gone on the factory bike anyway and topping the, the, the World Superbike test. Yeah. So it looked like everything was going to be super cool. And we yeah. went back, you know, we had the, the winter off or whatever. I trained like mad knowing that, you know, I want to make yeah, a, I want sure make a go at this. Yeah. And then topped the preseason test as well at the beginning of the season. Um, and then the team were like, oh, we can't afford to go to Australia for the for the oh, test there. Yeah. Um, your teammate's not riding. He was bringing a load of money. So it's going to be a one rider team now. And then, you know, unfortunately from there on, it was a bit downhill. But Unraveled. everybody's going to everybody's gonna have a, a take on it, right? Because some people will listen to this and be like, oh, yeah, of course it was that. Of course it was that because you think you're this or you think you're that. But ultimately, if you don't believe in yourself and, and you don't, mm. you know, if you can't justify things to yourself, then... You know who who's got the right to sit on a sofa and justify what you've done or what you haven't done? You know, well, I know. That's a big thing is it, a big thing in general is people don't know. Like you, you can go like obviously like if if there was something going on in the in the BSB paddock when you rode for Paul Bird, you'd know about it in the paddock. But not the people that are necessarily reporting, they wouldn't know what's going on. And like there's things like when I spoke to Jake about stuff, and I'm like, I know the truth. Like why are they saying that? And yeah, like there's so many different opinions, but you you know, like you know yourself, and like to be a successful racer you have to have a bit of an ego. You have to be, because to be successful, you have to beat these other people who are doing that, you know? So I completely get it. Yeah, I mean, I, um, and you can't ever underestimate who you're up against, can you? Like in like them championships, they're the best in the world. Like there's a lot of motorbike riders in the world and to, to filter through and even get there, it's, it's, it's tough, isn't it? And mm. that's another thing, like the ups and downs, the emotional roller coaster as a rider you go through isn't it? Like, I find the older I get, the the easier it is to cope sometimes. Was that something you dealt with really well? Was that like a strength of yours, like managing the the pressure and like the, because uh, obviously any season you win and after you won the first two BSB titles, I guess when you went back for your third, people was like, you got to win. Like it's, and did you, did you know that? Did you like make that aware to yourself? I think that um, one of the things that was, was really good for me was being, being an older rider when we had this last little run at, um, at BSB, one of the things that was super cool was, you know, people like you coming up that were quite a lot younger and were, were really fast and, and thinking, right, okay. So there's this, there's always been this old age, age old even thing of, of um, youthful exuberance versus experience, <laughs> isn't there? Do you know what I mean? So like, yeah. you know, you might, you might go out when the track was still a little bit damp and, and you might ride over some damp lines or, or, or ride over the white line or whatever and just think, I don't care, I'm going to send it, do you know what I mean? I'm going <laughs> to yeah. show them. Yeah. But, I might think to myself, do you know mm. what? You go crack on sunshine. Yeah. I'll just have like another five minutes, wait for it to <laughs> yeah. dry out and then I'll come out, yeah. you know, but I used to get a really big kick out of the fact that, you know, even, even being the oldest rider on the grid or one of the oldest riders on the grid that I'd, I'd prepare every single year a little bit differently and try and find that next little bit to, to keep me at the front. Yeah. And that was my, and that was my buzz. Do you know what I mean? A because you know that, you know that everybody wants you to fail. I mean, look, look at the, um, if you look back in time at like Mick Doohan, right? Mick was was a, a super successful guy and it seemed that at times that nobody could beat him. Yeah. But then they almost become like, oh, Doohan's won again. Do you know what I mean? Like that nobody They want the underdog. Yeah, nobody yeah. nobody thinks, Wow, this guy's incredible. He's on a great bike, he's doing a great job, you know, he's had a bad injury to his yeah. leg and, and and he's come back and he's still smashing it. They're all thinking, Oh, I can't such and such win it this yeah. weekend just to make it a bit come more on. interesting. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And you know, Valentino to to a degree, and then Mark Marquez came and then Mark started smashing it. Do you know what I mean? And it seems like yeah. everybody that, that does a really, really good job, you know, ultimately you have a, a massive, massive, massive following, and then all of a sudden it's like, Oh, come on, let someone else win now. Do you know what I mean? I when know, it's getting yeah. boring. And you think I, I, the amount of work that goes into yeah. making sure that that success carries yeah. on is like unbelievable. They think you just hop off the bike in October, lounge around, off to Spain, bit yeah. of a holiday till January, February. Well, to be Ooh, fair, that was true. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but they just think that it's just, you get on a bike and it happens, but it's not. It's about like, even like the, you said about the building blocks of your team, like you earning the team's respect, your team earning your respect. And 
yeah, it's such a team effort, isn't it? And it's like the whole the whole thing as is just it's incredible. And obviously, yeah. I think the unique thing about it as well is it is a team effort, mm. but it's a team effort until the until the lights go out. Because yes, then it's all on you. It is. And and that's the that's the weird thing about it, you know. Like when you're when you're playing football or you're you're doing a, a team sport, you know, the, the team the team go through the emotion with you. Do you know what I mean? The team you uh, win together, the, you lose yeah, together. Yeah, you win together, yeah. But you know, you, you would have probably found this already, right? The weird thing about motorbike racing is it's a team sport, right? We also have a team sport, you need a team around you, you need this, you need that. We win together or we lose together. But I always found that if I if I won, I had a great team, but if I lost, I was a shit rider. And it's like, well, hold on a minute. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but what happened there? Do you know what I mean? It's uh yeah. it, it's weird how it how it kind of comes around. You know, I think that um I think that yeah, a lot of teams at the moment just want to go racing because they need to go racing and, and you know, that pays some wages and, and you know, bring some sponsors in and, and stuff like that. But I think that um yeah, the sport could be a bit more sporting at times. Yeah, talking back about the uh, the youthful exuberance you were saying about earlier, it was really funny because it was um, I was saying before we actually started recording that it was at Fruxton and um, you, I don't know what happened. I'm sure you qualified at the front and you, to be honest with you, you was probably setting a pace and just going, I'll stick to this pace because I know that five laps to go, everyone's going to fall off, their tyres are going to shit themselves as such and and yeah and you'll just mosey on through which is probably what you did but I remember this time I can't be behind you and it was a bit like, oh shakes in front of me and I literally out broke into the chicane and thought oh yeah have that go on and I got back <laughs> yeah I was like oh yeah right next person and I and then I come back down the straight next lap no you passed me actually going onto the onto the straight and I was, I was like, just out breaking again get upside but you'd moved over to the right anyway and then you broke like however many meters later and I thought bastard like how's Oh, and I remember coming in thinking, oh, if I've got to race these guys, man, these guys literally adapt corner to corner. Like, I don't, I, this is this is mad. And I remember it was such a like big thing for me in my career in the early days, like having to race you guys because it taught me so much, like having to be able to adapt quickly to them situations. And I guess you probably didn't even know about it and you probably didn't even consciously think about it at the time. You just knew, right, I need to protect myself there. But it's, um, yeah, like it's, it's it was just incredible, obviously, to to have that and... There was many more battles, um, and obviously a lot of people had the same thing with you, <laughs> didn't they? <laughs> Having battles. I, I think that um, I think that one of the things, one of the key things to, to BSB, right, is if I if I was on pole or on the front row and I got a start, and I knew through practice and quality, I always say, right, that Monday was always my day off. Yeah, um, what I did Tuesday through to Thursday or Tuesday through to Friday prepared me in the best possible way for, for Friday morning, mm. right? Then I wanted to come out on Friday morning, absolute smash it out of the park in the first couple of laps just to... just to taking set, notes here. Yeah, set, <laughs> set, set a marker, do you <laughs> know what I mean? And and to try to, try to almost... Um, destroy everyone before you'd even before you'd even got yeah, going do you know yeah. what I mean because when you go out and you do a lap time it's like two seconds quicker than the next person in in like two laps yeah. or whatever they're like oh, hold on a minute oh, do you know what I mean yeah. <laughs> what have we got to do really? yeah. um so then the work you do on Friday through to or sat well now Saturday lunchtime yeah. because you race in Saturday afternoons um you know that prepares you for Saturday afternoon and for Sunday right yeah um you know what it's like when the when the lights go out. There's no more. There's no more nonsense, is there? There's no more adjustments. Yeah. There's no more nothing. You've got what you've got, and you've and got to do it. your job. Um, so I'd always try if I could if I could get a good start and I can get away, fantastic. I'd I'd go with that. But I, you know, I'm happy to, to to lead a race or to sit at the front and do my thing. But do you know what? If it, if it if I'm trying quite hard and I'm not getting away, and and you know the group's still there, and I've got I don't know a group of five people behind me, literally plus zero. Just think, you know what? Crack on, yeah, boys! I'll, yeah. I'll sit there for a bit and and you know wait till the end because, like you say, Fruxton, for instance, Fruxton, yeah, if it's a seventeen lap race, it's a twelve lap procession and a, and a sort of you know two lap build up and then a three lap race, isn't it? Because yeah. you, you kind of know that you you can't go all in there for for seventeen laps or whatever. So it's yeah, stay th safe for the yeah. first few laps, haven't you? Stay yeah. out of the carnage. It's just about yeah, just looking after what you got underneath you and and you know making sure that you know when the time comes, you're you're ready to strike. And what was you, what do you think would be the toughest BSB championship win? Because obviously you and Keo went went at it. Wasn't it Alton Park when you both did you both break down? You broke down, didn't you? At Alton one time. He knocked me off at Alton in oh, 14. He, oh, did he? Yeah. yeah. Was it 14? Yeah. Because yeah. he was quite he was that guy was so unassuming. He walked around the paddock, he was so shy, he was so oh hello. Mm. But and he used to go and drink loads of beer, didn't he? And he but when he got on the bike, he was just like maniac, weren't he? An animal, yeah. yeah. Do you know what? He's um he's one of the people of all the people that have raced mm. in BSB, he's one of the people that I kind of look up to and respect the most, not because he's 
the sort of second most successful in terms of championships yeah. or whatever. But because there was always this kind of air about him that, you know, when he was my teammate, yeah. it was like you could be you could be two seconds a lap quicker than him in, in practice or whatever if he was having a bad day. But you know that on Sunday he's <laughs> going to be there or thereabouts. Yeah. And you also know that he's got exactly what you've got underneath him. Do yeah. you know what I mean? And, and you, you hit the nail on the head earlier on when you said you can never underestimate any any of your rivals. Mm. And he was one rival that I always just thought, you know, it doesn't matter if he qualifies 15th or 20th, I know that if I lead... 18 of a 19 lap race <laughs> on the 19th lap he's going to be there and he's going to be one of the You're people that yeah and and you just think oh flipping hell like he was one person that I could never just um how can I say never just think, oh, I don't know yeah I've beaten him on a Friday yeah. he yeah. ain't coming back yeah no yeah. because you knew that you knew that he would and and you know mentally I think he was quite strong with that yeah and what would you would you say like is it fair to say like the failures that you did have over the years did they make the successes that much better or did they like do you say like Michael Jordan said he took like 10,000 he missed like if he took like 10,000 shots however many he missed obviously made him the player he was with racing obviously you fall down you, there's a lot more to racing in terms of something like you said the team didn't have the funding that mm -hmm. impacts you um, would you say like the failures made you more hungry to to be successful? Did you ever sort of was that like in the back of your mind, like in an off season, let's say, and you're like, right, I need to get to work harder. Come on, like you're being lazy. Like was that mindset thing always like in you? You think? Yeah, I think so. I think I, I always had a saying that like, the, the the bad days made the good days better. Mm. And you know, fortunately for me, there were there were quite a few good days. But you know, the difference between you know you, you're talking you're talking such incremental changes. Like if for instance, you score uh, 45 points over the course of a weekend, right? That 45 points over the course of a weekend is great if you have a second and then a first. You know, you drive home quite happy yeah. and you'll get a McDonald's on the way home. Do you know what yeah. I mean? You'll be buzzing because you've won a race or whatever. But if you have a first and then a second, you drive home with exactly the same amount of points, but you drive home absolutely <laughs> devastated. Yeah. You don't want to eat. You just no. want to get up the yeah. next morning and go training yeah. and, and, and like absolutely smash it out of the park because you finished second yeah. on the last race. So whenever we go into like a, a winter break or, or you know, if we go into like, you know, we have the breaks in the summer or whatever, yeah. you know, if you've, if you've not won the last race, do you know what I mean? You're like, oh, flipping hell, do you know what I mean? Like it, it just oh, completely yeah. destroys you, doesn't it? So yeah. I think when you, when you want something as bad and when it's, it, when it's as ingrained in, in you as it is in me, it's always difficult to accept anything other than, than sort of absolute perfection, if you know what I mean. And was the failure scary? Like, did you sort of, would you fear, did you fear failure of yourself? Like, because... Like you say, like it's a team effort, but when you foul, it's a lonely place, isn't it? Like mm. you don't even want to see your misses. You think, oh god, she's. And even though they're not disappointed, like the kids, but you go, oh, like I've let them down, and it's like you don't want to talk to them. Do you? Like you don't want to talk to them. You don't want to be like, like oh god, I'm I'm fouled. Like did that? Was that anything? Did that sort of? I tell you one thing that did you? that. Well, <laughs> the the thing I relate to with that is that I I got to a point where you know, winning's fun, right? We all, we all go racing because we want to win. Yeah. But the problem is the more you win, the, the, the shorter the, the buzz or the rush is, right? Yeah. So you win a race at Brands Hatch, yeah? By the time you get to Paddock Hill Bend, you're kind of over it and, and you mm. just want to go to the next one. Yeah. But I always think that... I don't know, I'd probably do an in-lap waving at everyone first. <laughs> <laughs> I, honestly, it's, it's so, so strange. Like I've won, I've won championships there yeah. and got to Surtees and been thinking, right, how are we going to keep this going? What are we going to do for next yeah. year? Do you know what I mean? And like the, the, the kind of focus or whatever's gone. But on the on the flip side, I think that y you know, if you if you didn't have that, if you didn't have that that kind of drive and, and determination, then you, you wouldn't be yeah, you know, if you rested on your laurels because you won one race, then you you probably wouldn't win another. Do you know what I mean? That's my problem. It's not. That's my problem. It's not your problem at <laughs> I've all. I've rested on my laurels. No, that? you haven't. But I know what you're saying, though. Like, even in Superstock, how I can relate to it, and I'm, I don't want to talk about me, but how I relate to it was in Superstock. I'd, you'd go across the line and be like, right, cool, ne box tick, next one. Yeah. Box tick, next one. Championship, right, next next challenge. And it is like that. And I think sometimes, yeah, you have to look back and go, like, I remember having a moment, and actually, I was your teammate at the end of 2015, and I was like, bloody hell man like I'm your teammate I'm sat in the top end of the garages I'm on a on a really good bike and it was like that was quite a surreal moment for me where I sort of remember like reflecting on where I'd come from and where I wanted to go and do you ever remember having any sort of moments like that where you was like oh, like I've won five championships now and then obviously you was going into your sixth you won six championships and it was obviously mad isn't it like you 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 dominated as well didn't you at the end do you know what's really weird right you were my teammate and I was thinking about it on mm -hmm. the on the way up here but without being being rude or being horrible i don't really remember it because there would have been there would have been a much bigger picture for me and that picture would have been trying to win the championship, the championship and and 
you know, I, I've had I've had some really fast teammates. Mm you being one of them I've had Noriyuki Haga as a teammate right and I looked up to him he was like a hero of mine back in the day I went to yeah. watch him in World yeah. Superbike he came along to be my teammate and I absolutely wiped the floor with him yeah. and I was like hold on a minute this can't be Noriyuki Haga do you yeah. know what I mean? who's this imposter yeah, this but fake. it's uh, it, it's yeah it's so strange I think that yeah we, we are we are super driven and super focused people and you know I said when I had my crash like you look at them crash helmets there and and you know life for me has always been looked through you know like through this this sort of aperture this opening yeah. if you like of 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 a crash helmet and and you know all i really see is motorbike racing and it kind of blocked out it blocked out what was going on in the news and it blocked out yeah. you know what was going on and yeah i remember one thing one thing that stood out and this is really random i remember seeing an ad, a, a, a news article once on tv right and it was it was a, a mum complaining about the cost of taking children on holiday in the school holidays right which is really random i know yeah but i remember thinking True. at the time yeah, yeah. But i remember thinking at the time i didn't have kids at the time yeah, obviously, okay. but, um i remember thinking oh, you got nothing better to moan about do you know what i mean like yeah. just just find something to focus yeah. on right because i ain't got time to do all that shit no, do you yeah, know? Yeah. I've, got, I've got championships and races to yeah. win but then when you uh, when you have a couple of kids and you want to take them out of school and they want to find you for taking them yeah. out of school or you got to pay triple the money to do it and now, all, now all of a sudden it's, like, it's, it's got a bit more relevant yeah and then obviously yeah like the crash that that year because that year started it was obviously it was early when it? it was at the snetson test i yeah. remember the day actually and i remember it just being like a cold it was like a dreary day i just remember the whole like, i remember the feeling actually and I actually, when I come around the track, I saw you laying there after the crash and it was, yeah, it weren't nice for me, let alone yourself. But like, obviously that, that kind of changed your whole life trajectory, didn't it? Mm. That moment, like how, how was that whole thing for you? Like the family, obviously like Petra, like the kids, like it was a, it was a big kind of point that changed your whole family's life really, isn't it? Yeah. It was difficult because it was a, it was, you know, a bad, a bad crash, you know, ultimately every time we get on the bike, we know one could happen, don't Definitely. we? But you, you, you don't. You know, you don't go there thinking about that. I mean, I've I've got, I've still got numbers that I want to achieve. You know, I I still have I still harbour this ambition to come back. Yeah. Um, I I don't know if that'll ever go away because I think when something's so deeply in you, in, yeah. it, it's hard to just think, well, that might be the end of my career. Then, if it is, it might be a bit of a drama because you know what, I didn't really enjoy any of it enough at the time it's like i said about the the thing of crossing the line right you cross the line you get to Panagill bend and you're like right great championship one right next one you know yeah, what i mean yeah never sat there and thought oh, i just won a championship blah, blah blah this is absolutely fantastic um but the 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 crash yeah changed everything in a heartbeat because you know now we're in a situation where yeah my head and my heart are, are, are brand new ready yeah. for ready for action do you know what i mean and, and and all set to put a crash helmet on but my body just isn't yeah and you know, you all know yourself, you've spent probably more years racing motorbikes than I actually have with, with all your schoolboy stuff yeah. as well. But y you're so used to falling down and hurting something and, and putting a time on it before, you know, you, you bang Six yourself, weeks. don't you? You yeah. know, yeah, yeah, you know exactly how long it's going to take, you know exactly what, what you've done pretty much. You, know, you think, oh, bust the wrist, oh no, that's going to be a couple of weeks or it's going to be three weeks yeah. or whatever. And and you're all set and ready and, and, and your next target is to get back on your bike again. But sometimes when yeah that that's all i knew but this one isn't hasn't been like that at all do you know what i mean there, there is no time and it's not even my choice either no. it's like you know surgeon says this or the surgeon says that or surgeon says look you you're that close to you not even being here do you know what i mean like what are you what are you playing at and when they when they start talking like that it kind of puts things into perspective a little bit so I made a bit of a deal with myself about some of the some of the health issues that I have at the moment, and and figured that if I could get to a point where where they return to normal or, or they they kind of heal themselves, then then yeah, you, you'd contemplate going again because I, I don't want nothing else. I'm not interested in in life without racing. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, but they don't seem to be healing, and and that's that's like a really tough pill to swallow because I'm not stupid. I'm 47 years old now. Um, you can't force it, can you? It's not no. like you, oh, take the magic pill and you'll no, be fine. No, exactly yeah. that. Yeah, but at the same time, if if your if your spinal cord, which is something you don't get to play with, right, is is that badly damaged that that stuff inside you don't work how it should because the signal's broken, you know, it's only you're only a, a step away or literally like a, a nick away if you like from. Um, you know, from not walking or, or whatever else. And, and that I can't, I can't deal with. You know what I mean? So 
How many bones was it you broke in that crash? Oh, mate, so, 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 so Because you have such a severe break that the other little breaks that we'd call, mm. that you'd call little, but be like broken arm, broken mm. collarbone. How many was it in total? I remember, I remember um, one funny thing is in 2000, I broke my back at Sneston and I broke what's called a transverse process, which are little, um, the little wing bits that kind of come off the side of your spine. Yeah. They're completely encased in muscle. Mm. Um, so they can't go nowhere anyway. In, in theory, it's like, you just got a bad back. You, yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Don't yeah. even worry about it. <laughs> but <back>. but <laughs> when you uh, when you sat there and you tell someone, yeah, I broke my back and racing again three weeks later, you feel like he man. Yeah, it's not it's not <laughs> it's not a big deal. But I remember my surgeon telling me or well, going through a list of some of the oh. stuff that I broke and and that, that I da- damaged in that accident. And uh, I remember him going through all of the the sort of bigger bits and then then going on to trans uh, ribs and stuff. He's like, oh yeah, you've done all your ribs, blah blah blah. Um, you know, you, you broke your chest, um, you've broke your neck, you've shattered the, the t- two top bones, you've peeled your spine open and that's what's exposed your spinal cord and blah, blah, blah. And he's going through all this really, really deep shit. And then he's like, and then uh, there's these little bones on the side of your of your spine. They're called transverse processes. And I was like, oh, I broke one of them before. And he went, well, now I can't remember what the number was, but now you've broken another yeah, like, ten of them, oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, like loads. And, and I was like, ooh. Oh, <laughs> this this yeah. was this was quite big, you know. Yeah, yeah, it was. Yeah, it's a horrible time, and it's just obviously your positive outlook, and I guess yeah, like it, it's just the whole thing for me, like overcoming an injury like that is such a it was such a serious injury, weren't it? it I I've, I actually saw you there, and it made me feel sick, and I was like bloody hell, like that that's not good, and it was just yeah miserable day, weren't it? It was just. Do you remember much about the crash itself? Did you, your body probably just thing. shut off, didn't it? Though like no, the shock. I remember. I remember. Um, I remember the whole day. I remember. I remember actually I I just got current again in a in a helicopter and I was actually going to fly myself up there in the morning um land at Sneston and then do the test and then fly back home. Um Sneston was a track that I absolutely loved. I'd won eight of the last 10 races there um and I had a podium on the other one. Um so I was really looking forward to the test. I was really looking forward to the to the race actually. It's a track that that I'd done well at. Enjoyed, yeah. But I got myself current in the helicopter, got everything sorted, but you need to to be legal. You need to carry a license around with you in a helicopter. And mine hadn't come back from the CAA yet, so I had to go up the night before. And I remember getting up and staying at the hotel and, you know, seeing the mechanics and what have you and being like, right, okay, half of them were in um, in the Northwest 200 actually with Glenn. So I only had like a, a sort of skeleton crew, if you like, but um, got up in the morning, everything was cool, went to the track. Like you say, it was a bit of a... Oh, Weird day, weren't Weird it? it had like day, a crosswind, yeah. but like bit like dreary. But yeah, not, well, it weren't yeah. sunny, it weren't yeah, hot, yeah, but it weren't just, cloudy and it weren't it cold. Weird. It was just yeah, it was like grey, yeah, windy, yeah. bit windy. Yeah, I always um, always make a point of going out last. Um, I never like to go out first because I don't like people tagging onto me. And generally, I can get up to speed really quickly as yeah. well. So if I go out in um, the beginning of pit lane, you either have a load of people kind of chase you, don't you, and try yeah, and get definitely. a tow, or if you go in the middle of it, you know, you'll have people who waiting. will get going and they'll be waiting or then they'll make a mistake and then they'll roll out of it. Do you know what I mean? And, and that interrupts my rhythm. And do even though it's testing, you still had that mentality. Yeah, I, I, I want to get, get out and yeah. I want to go. So I waited to the end. Uh, everyone had gone, just got out on track. Yeah, first lap, everything was was good. We had some new brake pads in and it's, yeah, it's impossible not to bed brake pads in at yeah. um, Snetterton, isn't it? So got that done and then first turn all good second turn perfect come out of second turn you know it's like a little bit of wind a little bit of wheelie just flick the bike left and and as i as i changed direction um and and peeled into palmer's the kind of back of the bike come around a little bit and you know it's like when you're on top of something you know you're one step ahead of the game like i'd already caught it before it come around but it kind of it went quite a long way and then sort of pinged straight a little bit but as we turn into Palmer's, you're sort of right on the outside of the track on the yeah. right-hand side, aren't you? And, you know, I'd, I'd grabbed a bit of brake. That set the bike sideways. I'd peeled in. It went sideways. It went straight. And then I kind of literally ran off the track. Yeah. But the trouble is we're doing like, I don't know, 130-odd mile an hour there, and, and you're straight onto, onto grass, grass, aren't you? And I thought, oh, okay, right, let's get some speed off. Do you know what I mean? So, off, like, yeah. try, to, uh, try to scrub some speed off. But back in 16 there... Um, Leon Haslam, a little bit further around the corner, stuffed me up the inside in the first lap of the race where I finished on the podium. And, um, you know, he came in super late and it sat me up that much that it run me off the track, yeah. right? And I managed to, to scrub enough speed off that I turned on the grass, stayed on, on the grass and then got back on the track, joint last. 
and then got through and got, got the podium. Through. Yeah. So your, I don't know, muscle memory or, or, or whatever tells you. Because it's instinctive. Exactly, it's in, yeah. It's a few seconds. Yeah, you've you, got you, that. You, yeah. Do, you basically do what you think's right, yeah. don't you? I thought, right, I'll get some speed off, slow down, start to turn, get around the corner, get back on the track and, you know, give the left-hand tyre maybe a little bit more, yeah. <laughs> a little bit more yeah. time. Got time, yeah. But I remember like I remember trying to slow down and, and like using the brake and nearly tucking the front and trying to turn and nearly tucking the front and, and you know, having all these goes at getting all this, this speed off. Got this, yeah, I've still, this. Got it, yeah. still got it, still yeah. got it, still got it. But then I looked up and and literally um you know, it's in your peripheral vision, yes. isn't it? But you're you're concentrating that much on what's what's going on and trying to get the speed off. I looked up and I saw the barrier coming, I thought, Oh no. Uh, it is that I, as well. I, I haven't got it this, do that, you know what I mean? Yeah. I haven't got it at all. Um so I had to jump and um yeah, I remember jumping and I remember talking about that aperture of the crash helmet. I remember after I'd hit the barrier, I was laying on the floor and the weird thing was, was like I could, I obviously I could only see through the aperture of the crash helmet because I had the crash yeah. helmet on, but I couldn't, I couldn't see and I could see, um, I couldn't see what was in front of my eyes. I could see, you know, like a, our dashboards on on the bikes. I could see like a dashboard, and I could see all these dials and gauges and stuff yeah. going up and down, and I could hear all these really weird noises. And like, you know, like if you imagine like an air raid shelter alarm yeah. going off or something like that. Yeah. There were all these alarms and all these dials going up and down, and I I couldn't I could hear ever so slightly, and I could see ever so slightly, but the predominant noise and the predominant uh, vision I had was this was these alarms and this thing. So it was really really weird, but then. After that, I don't really remember too much until meeting my my surgeon in the hospital. So, yeah, I think it was a big old bang on the head. Yeah, man, it's it is it is like that, and yeah, I mean the crash itself, mate. It's like like you said, like everything's so instinctive, and when you're on the bike, you make like split second decisions that probably even quicker than a second, and it? it's like mm. milli milli seconds, and you go. And like you said, like you, oh, I've made this before. Oh, I'll be alright. Mm. And then you you kind of see how fast you're approaching things, and you're like, oh shit, but. But by then it was too late, wasn't it? And it's like, yeah, and like you say, how your body goes into that, like, because that probably was like, I mean, I'm obviously not a doctor, but that probably was like shock, wasn't it? Like the alarms and, mm. yeah, oh, it's mad. And yeah, mate, obviously, like the fact that you're here now, you're living, you could make a comeback. Hopefully you don't. <laughs> not while I'm raging anyway. <laughs> I can't deal with that again. <laughs> you could be under pressure. Yeah. Yeah, Paul, get me a bike ready. I'm coming back. <laughs> yeah. And then obviously, so like now, like life now, obviously you've got the kids, you've got the family, you spend a bit of time in Spain. Yeah, yeah, you're just in, enjoying yourself in general. Like obviously, the Eurosport thing. How's that? How's that like getting the other side of the camera? Like it's really weird. It's it's really good on a on a good day or on a bad. Say that's the wrong way around. It's really good on a bad day, right? When when you guys are, are on the grid and it's half wet, half dry, horrible conditions, on, and yeah, crack on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Stand here and watch. Yeah. I know how much it hurts when yeah. you upside down. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, on on the on the sunny days, like yeah watching you at Cadwell last year, do you know what I mean? Just absolutely on rails and, and, and smashing a double win. Just, yeah, you look at stuff like that and you just think, oh, I just want to be out there so bad. Do you know what yeah. I mean? Like looks, days like, days like Cadwell for you last year were, were the days that, that racers dream of, weren't they? You they know, you motivate never, you. That's what yeah, motivates me. Yeah. It's never like, put a foot wrong. But do you know, like you, even now, if I said it now, I know that you'll take yourself back there, but riding out of pit lane for like FP1, FP2, brands out, sun shining, mm. like that feeling, isn't it? Like, even when you're not on the bike, you can feel, you still get that special, like, oh, yeah, I do love that. And mm. yeah, mate, fingers crossed that you can, even if you got fit enough to do track days, I'm sure you'd go and do track days because you'd, all right, you wouldn't be winning the British Championship by doing a track day, but you'd still get that feeling, wouldn't you, probably, of the joy. Get that buzz. I you think, probably I would, wouldn't you, though? Buzz. You'd get that, yeah. There's nothing, there's nothing that... Um, the noises, the sound, the speed, yeah. all them elements. It's the sensation, isn't it? Yeah. It's, sensation's the word you're looking for, you know, the... The feeling of acceleration, yeah. the feeling of deceleration, you know, the the feeling of hanging on for grim yeah, death, yeah. and the, pushing the, the physical limit. Yeah, the the effort required to do it as well yeah. at the top level. That's yeah. what people underestimate. You know, I always said that I wish there was some sort of simulator that you could sit somebody on, right? One of them people who type stuff on the on their keyboards, and I wish you could sit them on it for a lap, and they had to feel exactly what we have to feel yeah. in terms of like you know how you get pulled and pushed about and 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 all mm. the g forces and whatever else. Because you know yourself, it's so, so physical to, to ride a bike. And we train for it all winter long, right? And we maintain that training all, all season long. It's not like we just rock up on a, on a Sunday morning and think, right, let's go and ride our bikes around. No, you exactly, know what I mean? yeah. So 
to give them some some context to, to how much work we put in, it'd be great to be able to sit them on it and say, right, do you know what? If you fall off this now, right, because of these forces, you know, you're going to end up with a busted neck or a busted back or whatever. Now sit there and shut up and, and get off your keyboard because you'll realise after how hard it yeah. is, you know. Yeah, we've got to wrap up soon, but I just want to say, like, I was going to say, before, um, I used to say to people when I first went to BSB in 2015 for a proper season, I used to say, if you went to a club racer or somebody aspiring to be a British Superbike runner said, right, there's my team, there's my bike, there's my crew, there's everything, guarantee they give you that back end of the weekend and go, I don't want any part of that. Because <laughs> <laughs> once you get into it, obviously it's quite, it becomes normal, but... At first, it's hard, isn't it? Like the level, I don't, you can't comprehend. When you look at Superstock and you look at Superbike, you go, it's only a second and a half a lap. You can't comprehend how hard that second and a half a lap is, can you? Every lap, like, it's pretty impressive, isn't it? And I know I keep saying about you winning, like, I think, you need, I think you, you're doing yourself injustice by saying you, uh, like, you, you wanted more out of your career because that is, that is a phenomenal career. Did you have a number in mind? Like, I don't think speaking to you that if you won eight championships you'd be like no I wanted a no. ninth one I think I think that that 100 wins was there was the yeah. the next what milestone did you get? 85 um that was I got that, five people I got five <laughs> I might have more than that I don't know it might be six <laughs> that, that was where I uh, that was where I wanted to be um but I wanted to just keep on winning do you yeah. know what I mean championships just, yeah. championships championships because you always want to you always want to set something in stone. I mean listen Records are like rules, aren't they? They're all meant to be bent and broken. That's the way I see it. Um, and, you know, probably someday someone will be. That's why he was a hooligan and you younger. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, yeah, you know, if uh, 100 wins and 10 championships would have been pretty cool. But even those, you know, I'd swap all six or all 10 or whatever of them for one world championship. Yeah. That's that's the key for me, you know. It's it's not an injustice. It's just that when when you want something as much as I wanted to be a world champion, and you know you had it, yeah. Nothing Fair nothing else is uh, is ever good enough. Don't get me wrong. I've had a I've had a fantastic career so far. If if that is my career and I am done, then I guess it wasn't so bad. But did I achieve everything I wanted to achieve? No, I didn't. No. Um, so on that note, it, it's not <sighs> great. Pending. Shaky burn is pending. I'm worried now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going back to Pimsy. <laughs> but, um, but no, we've got to let you go, mate. We're going to catch up. We've got to catch up with you again during the season because I've got so much more stuff I want to ask you. No worries. But, me um, waffling. No, but no, you, mate, you, I've seen no. all your questions. Yeah, and I no, just waffle no, and waffle no, and thank waffle. You. you told me to waffle like it's a chat between waffle. mates. Yeah. And that's what we've done. <laughs> <laughs> no, but honestly, thanks for coming on, mate. Um, it's been a pleasure, obviously, to have you on the podcast. And we're definitely going to catch up end of the season or mid-season. For a, for another one, if you're uh, if you're in the city, yeah, no worries. Very best of luck. We'll get you looks, a full cappuccino as well. This looks great, actually. I'm really <laughs> impressed, and I'm glad that you've uh, you got some good people behind you. And uh, I hope it goes well for you. Cheers, mate. Thank you. No worries. Big boom, Danny, what a ride! This is and it is on.